Good evening, everyone. Um, I think everyone, maybe not even, maybe not everyone knows me here. Uh, my name is Carolyn Hanshin. I am the director of the Office for UN Relations for the Women's Federation and currently president also of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women in Geneva. And in fact, that is one of the ways that uh, that Letitia and I came into contact with each other. Letitia is, I consider, a friend, um, yes. really quite a remarkable person. Um, I will just tell you a little bit about her. You saw, I think you saw from the flyer or something, but she is um, she is a cultural anthropologist. She worked uh, many years in uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Af Africa, and even Southeast Asia. I'm not sure exactly where in, in Asia. I didn't hear so much about that. But uh, she talks about beginning her career in as an uh, uh, English teacher, in fact, and then going much, much further with that, but maybe beginning her love for Africa and the people of that area probably be, maybe began at that point. Uh, but her her expertise is in the area of you know refugees, migration, community development, and then now more recently, access to health. Um, so I don't want to tell her whole story for you, uh, to you, but rather let her tell her story. So I will introduce to you Miss Letitia Van Haren. Um, we're all very much looking forward to hearing from you, Letitia. Maybe what we do is we let her speak for about 10, 15 minutes, uh, and then we can stop and we can see we can take to have some questions or discussion, or then we we can see how, how we go from there. Okay? Okay, Letitia. Okay, thank you. Am I mute or unmuted? No, you're unmuted, huh? Okay, good. So you hear me? Yes. Uh, Thank you all for being there. I'm uh, I'm really, uh, first of all, I was very pleased with Carolyn's invitation because you get so many of them where you have to kind of focus on a certain thing and you forget about everything that went past you. So it was an opportunity to think, but how did I get where I'm now? Mm -hmm. Well, I was born in 1950 in a, in a family and I have well, they're not alive anymore, but in a family with 11 brothers and sisters. So we were 11 in total. Wow. But, you know, people sometimes get scared, but we're not all there at the same time. You can be reassured <laughs> that things grow slowly and <laughs> some leave the house and others uh, are joined. So already from a very early age, I was extremely interested in non-Western cultures. And that was perhaps because we were, you know, I was in the Catholic South. We went to Catholic schools and we sometimes had these nuns coming with their very smothered uh, skin wrinkled all from the tropical sun and telling these in extraordinary stories that really fascinated us. And my father, as a sort of uh, somebody of the, let's say, he was a magistrate, so he had some kind of standing in the in the village. Therefore, he also had all these positions in committee here and committee there. So we received all that information about what's going on in Sudan, what was going on in, in Africa. And it was from the start very much interested in how do these people live, not what separates us but really what binds us and i think the whole development that makes me sad of what we are doing now that everybody seems to be trying to find out in what we are different well we are different in almost everything and but that we are also alike in almost everything so that has never never been my point it was always trying to find when these people celebrate something how do they do it how does it well it was just spontaneous not not expressed that way so that's how it started and uh but i realized everybody in my family if you have a lot of brothers and sisters you always have a critical chorus at the background that you have to protect yourself from because they will always find fault with whatever you try to do so, or say. So I learned to keep quiet about this interest. And it's only when I was almost getting my uh, my uh, school, my high school diploma in classical lycée, 
uh, that my father said, so, and Leticia, what do you want to study? And I said, well, actually, I'd like to study cultural anthropology. What? He said, cultural anthropology? This is with the communist and the socialist, and you cannot earn your money with it. It's just totally, it doesn't give you any future. So, and uh, so he wasn't really happy with it. But on the other hand, he was not somebody to stop us. I mean, he expressed his his disappointment. He said, you would have made a perfect lawyer. He himself was a magistrate. He felt that everybody, all of us, we first had to try law. And law was what really was for everybody, unless you were very good at math, which we weren't, because there was not so much math stimulus at home. So <laughs> I was allowed to do my cultural anthropology. When I started to be interested, it was called ethnology. And I remember being fascinated by the first ones like Franz Boas, who was a, a physical um, a physical scientist, a physicist, and he went to the uh, to the South Pole and he was so intrigued by all these little men in canoes around him that he just completely abandoned his scientific career studying rocks and ice and he became a specialist of the uh, Inuit peoples. So uh, all this, um, uh, th this was all very interesting for me and I have not ever regretted that I studied cultural anthropology. It has always been very inspiring, very useful, but indeed, as my father, father said, never to earn a lot of money or to earn any money at all. You can forget about that. <laughs> it was almost, it was always promised when my husband worked with UNHR, I had a lot of contacts. I did, I gave advice. I did uh, studies in the refugee camps in Somalia. And everybody was very pleased with it. And they said, yes, 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 we need more cultural anthropologists to make us, uh, you know, attune our assistance more to what these people are. But when they went for it, it was always going to be a sociologist who did statistical studies that had no reference to the people living in those places because you can never get the critical mass that sociological statistics are built on. So you could forget that, but it has always been inspiring. Okay, so uh, when I met my husband, he was studying uh, Dutch law, administrative law. So you cannot imagine anything more confined to our little country than what my husband was doing. And it's true that we are very much at opposites in how we, how we are emotionally. That's true. But still, we found common ground in social justice issues and interest in the wide world. My husband, much more as, you know, political, uh, the, the actual polit politics, history, for me, much more this uh, human factor. So when he proposed to me, I said, ah, oh, but I didn't want to marry at all. I mean, this is, I, I had said, I'm not going to marry because it's just not, not my thing. But well, I said, after all, if we can strike a deal somehow, that, well, I first have to go to some place, whether Asia or Africa, it doesn't matter, but I cannot become like my own mom immediately, because she was the the wife of a of a lawyer, uh, a judge, uh, etc., so a magistrate, and I could see the kind of life that she lived, and I thought, no, I, I love her dearly, but it's not for me. She said, okay, I'll go with you wherever you want to go. And then we tried to find a place opposite our uh, our home. There was an old lady, you know, a little bit of aristocracy alone. And we were her adopted family. We got presents with Christmas, et cetera. And she also had all these, uh, these people that she knew working in the mission. So she gave me the address of someone in Indonesia. And by that time, I started to learn Bahasa Indonesia, thinking, oh, I'll go to Indonesia. But it didn't. Well, it was. It wasn't Indonesia. I went to in the end through my my own father, who was, you know, the president of some sort of charity. They'd given a car to a brother with who's with the white father congregation, and he was 
thanking, uh, writing this letter of thanks that I, I saw. And then I wrote to him, hmm, does that director not need somebody in your school? We can help you build the school. And we got a letter back that said, we don't need anybody to help build the school. There's enough people around, but we do need teachers. Do you want to, do you want to teach uh, uh, chemistry? Do you want to teach physics? Do you want to teach? He, he mentioned everything, but there was also English. And then we said, okay, let's, let's choose for English. That's the safest to, to do, because with my cultural anthropological uh, studies, you do, you know, a lot of the of the works that you have to read are in English anyway. The the place was Congo, so they were going to have most of their lessons in English. But we were living in Congo, the east, which is close to the border with the English speaking Africa. So they had to also learn English and Swahili and French. So that was where I learned English because we got good material there to, to, uh, to do our teaching. We got the Oxford Dictionary for Advanced Learners. We got a good course, which was created for African learners. That was very progressive of our schoolmaster there that he didn't give us material that was made for Europe and then you know discarded to Africa. No, that was a course that was conceived to have African students get an, take an interest in Africa, learning English with things that were connected to what Africa was at that time and the Abu Simbel and and all these huge uh, proud pride inspiring uh, projects of development that young Africans who were going to be leaders one day should be inspired by. So that was very helpful. And that's how I learned myself my English because the school that I went to is classic. So you learn Latin and Greek and French and English and German and Dutch, but all to read the classics, not to speak. So when we first came to that place in in uh, in Congo, we had a little a little booklet which said spoon, fork, knife, well, all the little things that we never really learned at school. But I discovered that it was not a bad system, because in the end, for me and for those of us who have been educated this traditional way, we can go much further into a language. We can also you know, attack the structure much better because you, you've been trained to do it. So that's why I'm not so upset about it anymore as I was when I first started. I can't speak a word of French. I can't speak a word of English. What's this after so many years? But once you have to open your mouth, mouth to survive, the structure is much easier. Okay, so that was in Congo. That was the life-defining experience that everybody can understand. We were only 23, 22 and 26. We had our first baby there. When we first arrived, we were put in an old planter's house that they had divided up into three apartments for three young couples that were going to be teachers at the school. We were just dropped off with a little helicopter and then a Land Rover, and then you're there and there is no connection with the outside world, period. You just live right there. So that's um, how you also have a completely different experience than young volunteers have when they go abroad nowadays because they bring their smartphones. And in fact, when we were coaching new volunteers in Southeast Asia, we had to tell them, please make sure that you do not constantly refer back to your own family and friends. Make sure that you create your community here and set yourself a certain limit of time that you connect back with your family. So it was tough to be all alone when you are pregnant and you don't understand what's happening and you don't feel well and it's a rainy season and there is the pest and there is meningitis and there is all kinds of diseases and you cannot get out and there is no and there is no um, proper health care to speak of. But at the same time, you learn much better what it is to live there and how people live and how how, how this uh, affects or how you how you develop in this kind of environment. So that was the start. Then when we we even extended with one year, so the, the third year 
the other volunteers had left because uh, one couple had gone to Goma to be a little bit more in an urban area. The other couple had gone, I guess, to Kinshasa. She was, she was Congolese herself, he was Belgian. And we were the only ones to stay. And then we realized that we could not stay more than that one extra year, but because once we were there alone, we were pulled into the local politics. So you get much more into the threats of, um, uh, what is it, sorcery, uh, much more into the threats of you have to be pulled into this camp, politically speaking or tribally speaking, or in that camp, politically speaking or tribally speaking. And people came to say when I was feeling uh, diff depressed a little bit because my baby didn't grow and there was nobody to ask what was happening, why she was crying, why nothing was happening. And then people came to visit and said, we warn you, you're not looking happy right now. And you're under, you know, we have your eye on you. You have to be careful because it was the time of the Mobutu control and it was also affecting us. So we saw that one year was fine, but after that we had to leave. Also, my husband wanted to start a career by then and he managed to get into the UN first as a junior professional officer and by that time we had one child and the second child was born in the Netherlands and I had uh, I had finished all my exams but still had to do my master's degree so when he was sent to Lesotho which is at the other side of of Africa I came along and I was able to do my master's research there because someone from my university, also a cultural anthropologist, whom I also knew personally, was already working there in a, in a development mm -hmm. officer's job. And he was going to be and doing research in development so he could coach me or be my, my mentor in, the, in this research. So that's how I studied um, modern migrations in Southeast Africa. And uh, that was my, my master's uh, thesis that was accepted. And after that, I have uh, done consultancies in different countries. And then when we, I mean, it was just a lot. In When we went to Senegal, I got a very interesting job as the chief editor of publications and that third world editing uh, publications in English and French and mostly giving a platform to African or in any case non-Western researchers and workers and that was very very interesting because mm -hmm. they have their platforms but there was not it was not so easy to promote at that time uh, the uh, the full integration of African Latin American and Asian researchers so after that, but maybe uh, Letitia, maybe I'm just gonna just to take a little break here. Would anyone yep. like to make a comment or question or anything just to 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 maybe have a little bit of interaction? Introduce yep. yourself to Letitia because anyone? I can you can unmute yourselves, everyone. Yeah. So I'll just cut it short because that's a long story. And just to say, I've been in several countries and uh, every time, you know, uh, constantly, completely involved in, in working with the population, not only working, living with the population as well. And uh, then I started to have it more formalized as a refugee policy officer with a refugee policy group with ICMC, uh, International Catholic Migration Commission, uh, working on the selection board, the inspection board of the uh, UNHCR, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, um, with the director of Defense for Children International, the uh, humanitarian policy officer for ACT. And you can imagine that in all these situations, the, the background I have, has helped a lot because you've really had some, I would say, on the ground experience and exposure. But more and more, I got into uh, everywhere where I went, I discovered that whether it was in refugee situations or in normal life, women and, and girls were really always bad off, worse off than the men, wherever. So that was really, and especially for their health. Once I'd had 
uh, babies myself and being pregnant in difficult places, I knew that there were risks, though I never assessed them properly, of course, when I was pregnant the first time. I mean, if I look at it now, I may have hesitated or I would have gone back to Europe, but there was no question. There wasn't, it didn't come up in my head to do that. We didn't have the money and we were there with the local population. If they have their children in that area, we are going to be in the same in the same situation. Mm. So, but it does make you very much aware of the loneliness, the worries that you can have. And if something goes wrong, then it can go dreadfully wrong. So that's perhaps something that has been feeding my my interest in this. Then I think in the course of time, especially in Laos, I was befriended with the uh, in, with the director of WHO representation there, and that was in the period that mostly work wise about maternal health. And then I would my position was safe motherhood begins at home meaning healthy food, healthy living, having things ready, everything adjusted to what we knew at that time. But at the time, the WHO had started, that was around 2000, a policy that I have vehemently opposed, which was to create maternity waiting homes that would take the mothers or the expectant mothers away from their homes, allow them to sit there, cook their own things and wait for the baby to be born in some other place, safe and close to uh, a proper uh, gynecological care. Now, that sounds like a good idea, but if you do not know what time this baby is supposed to come, it means that you put your young children who stay at home at risk, that you come home and in the meantime, your husband has taken a younger wife because you are not available for him. And mm. that if you had a little business, nobody is running your business while you're away. So the price, the opportunity cost of safer motherhood was huge in terms of the loss in your the, the family unit, your, your farming, your everything else. So I, I thought if you want to really do that, you have to know much better when this woman has to go and spend some time near the nearest maternity uh, facility. And then, um, that, that, yes? I have a question. Um, what yes. was the purpose of this uh, maternity safe place? Uh, maternity waiting homes were because if you live in a village high up in the mountains and you start your contraction start, uh, you, it will be uh, too late to get to a place where you can safely deliver. So it was really to make sure that all these times that a woman starts out on the journey for her uh, for childbirth too late, to make sure that that problem was overcome in because there were no proper roads, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that brings me to why I decided that we have to have a better communication tool because even in places where women could walk on time to deliver their babies in safe hands they wouldn't always do so they didn't want to pay what they had to pay because they didn't have that money available yeah. they had to pay for transport or the transport was not available say so they didn't have the a clear idea when exactly they had to go to the hospital. So they were just waiting until the contractions were so strong that they say, ha, ha, we have to go. But that is too late. If you go and sit on a motorbike at that time, then there is a high risk of ruptured uterus and all kinds of other things. So I thought, as you cannot, you can bring a horse to the pond, but to the water, but it has to drink by itself. We have to bring the health seekers, the mothers who are pregnant, and the health providers, the, the, the professionals, together. Making them understand better each other's needs and learn to communicate better. So that was why, as time goes on, I thought, but why not an app? Why not do it, give them a, a tool that allows the women to know more about their pregnancy, 
that allows them to contact a health professional, that allows them, if we can get it, to contact a taxi service provider, uh, that perhaps also gives them the opportunity to save some money that the husband cannot take because it's over there and only for for the for the delivery and for the child. If we do something like that, we create a safe space, we create the understanding, we create conditions for better communication because even the health providers had never been trained in being polite and explanatory about what they do with their with their clients. They just say, you do this and why have you done that or more? There is, and now when I go to Africa now to different places, I see an enormous change. There is an awareness now among the health professionals that they have to learn to communicate better with the the health seekers, the mothers, whoever, and that they do not always have the skills to do so, or they do not have the language and they do not have the tools. So this is really what my present invention tries to do to meet that need and to cover that gap that I have experienced myself when I was when I had my first child and that I have found is still a great source of uh, increased maternal mortality, excess maternal mortality, where there could have been a much more serene way of expecting your child and getting there at the right time. That's in a nutshell how I got there right now and uh, what I'm doing right now. But of course, the road there was uh, <laughs> bumpy and varied. Okay. Um, I I would like to know a little bit more about what you are doing now. That's right. I was going to say that too. Please what talk. Do... Explain explain the app that you created and how it's working too. Uh, so the app that I'm, I will send you separately, what I will do is I can send you the link afterwards so that you can experience it. Yes. And then I want to say to you right now, you are allowed to experience it. But if you want to log in and you want to amuse yourself to log in as a health professional, you have to tell me because, of course, and I will only allow you to go into the testing site because the real sites are used by real patients and real doctors. So we shouldn't go there. And mm -hmm. also you have to be approved because to protect the women from somebody who is just a charlatan and say, I'm a doctor using this app, we, uh, you have to be approved by the director of the hospital. But in the testing site, uh, our team can do the approval, right? But the most mm -hmm. interesting is definitely if you are together, one of you says, I'm going to... Uh, to register as a, as a health professional, a nurse, a midwife, a doctor, and I'm going to uh, register as a mother and then try your interaction and mm -hmm. see how it works. Then you will find out better what you can do and what you cannot do. So uh, where we are now is that this app is ready to go live. My team absolutely assures me that it's ready to go live. I, as the nervous inventor and the person who has to push everything say let me see how well it is how good it is to go live and how much you know fiddling and fixing of bugs is still necessary but as they said correctly yes bb they call me bb which means grandma but bb if we don't start now you cannot make it strong but because it's only when you start using it that it becomes strong and that is true, too, because we have forgotten that in the beginning when we used WhatsApp or other applications, they were messy and they and, and, and sometimes they, you know, they just disappeared suddenly. But they could never have, you know, reached this point of robustness if they hadn't just thrown the child in the water and make it swim. So that's mm -hmm. what we are doing right now. And I have a team in Tanzania. I also have a team in Congo. But we have discovered that though it is fantastic to stimulate this collaboration between a former French speaking colony and a former English speaking colony where the French and the English have remained, in fact, separators for collaboration. That's a pity, but it is true. And we find now ways of getting together and say, OK, whatever they do at the top, but here in this border area, we're going to try to do it. 
but it requires a lot of active intervention of myself as as a you know a double speaker and therefore i first let now the tanzanians get it really going and then get back to the to the congolese users and make sure that we then have full attention to produce it in the way that is best for them because now they use translation but we do not always have the time to do it in the full so you understand so it's happening at the moment we have agreements with the Ilimela district authorities we are going to do the same with the Mugana district authorities we have several big health facilities who want to work with us and these health facilities have dispensaries like satellites all around where women can go for their antenatal and postnatal checkups so the whole purpose is that not only the women can therefore, you know, if it's rainy or if they are sick, they cannot come. They can still contact and say, I cannot come. They can ask a few questions or they can be, somebody can tell them, yes, but next time you have to come. We saw, we saw that your blood pressure is on the high side. So make sure there is this possibility. And... um for the moment, we start in Ilimela district where we have a formal agreement with the district medical authorities. We will start it in Sumve because the Sumve hospital, which is in that district, has been already visited by us. And they have also um, signed an agreement that they want to work with us. But of course, the big issue is now everybody has been trained. Where do I get the money to get it all going? Because these district authorities expect that you take also the expenses on you they do not you know that's that's the big challenge right now that i'm a little bit afraid of as as long as we did this in a sort of amateurish volunteer manner okay <laughs> with my savings and some donations of people who help fine but now we get into we have to add zeros to the figures of expenditure if we really make sure that we are not going to disappoint and that we are not going to be just paying for someone else to take our place, you see? Mm. Because we, I mean, it's just so amazing how the women, how the people themselves want this and say, this is really the thing that we need. I was so impressed by that. They mm. also are people from Kenya. I I met a woman in Kenya who said, yeah, but we need this in our peri-urban areas because there's young women with babies. They cannot sit there for hours waiting for their turn, you know, for their antenatal care. Or they do not want to be with the older women who look at her, at them disapprovingly like a young unmarried mother. What is this? So mm -hmm. if they have an app that sort of facilitates the contact, facilitates the learning, and then they can you know, choose their times for uh, for visiting better. They they really feel that that's that would be a great great achievement. So this is what we are doing right now. I'm extremely busy with micromanagement because we have a very good representative. He is what shall I say? Creative. He's sharp. He's everything, but he's not so organized for accounting for bookkeeping, for, for everything, or for sharing all his ideas. They come up in his mind. He starts to develop them, maybe the same as I do myself. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not accusing him, but we cannot have this anymore. We have to have a team. So I tell him, you have to tell what you're doing. And then I have found a young woman who is a programmer and who is an extremely well-organized, structured young lady, so I want her to be, you know, the one to take over one day from me. But you understand that there is huge resistance among the programmer and the developer. <laughs> it's all very well to do an app for women, but to say that they also have to boss it. No. <laughs> so I have to to use all my skills in uh, managing and keeping a nice spirit and uh, making sure that they do not run away with the booty, with the app and say, you forget it. And that they allow 
this young woman to be part of them and that they do not see her as a threat, but as somebody that who can help them to do even more. But that's a big, big, big challenge, I tell you. So so that's where I'm right now. Yeah, thank you. It's, any, any questions, anyone, or, or just some thought uh, related to, and please introduce yourself. Marcia, did you say who you were? Did you? No, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, so so Leticia knows like who start... she's talking to a little bit. I think yeah, that's nice Yeah, I, I would like to start by actually thanking you for uh, sharing this amazing experience and this amazing background that you have. And uh, uh, I'm the president of WFWP, the Women's Federation in Spain. Yes. And uh, and I think I saw you, I think it's possible that I saw you in one of the meetings that you were, or I, I'm not sure if you were the organizer, Caroline, but related to ter uh, gender terminology, is it possible mm. that she but was there? One of our yes, NGO meetings. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, I think uh, I saw you there. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, I know you have been also dealing with this uh, issue of the gender terminology. Yes. I don't know, maybe you would have something to say about it uh, in, the, in these places where you are um offering this kind of service that that you shared um well in the place first of all i just do not accept that uh motherhood in the in the biological sense i think that's just what is exactly related to to womanhood that the the, the biological difference is for that purpose doesn't mean that we all have to be women uh, to be become mothers to be fulfilled women that's a totally different story but still i i mean i really do not want women in these places for whom uh, motherhood and family are the things through which they live and and identify themselves i'm not going to tell them oh that's completely wrong you have to oh that's just crazy you shouldn't do that you shouldn't think that way it's 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 against your rights so i do not think that this is an issue that i want to raise in my in my work if there are if we happen to have in our among our users a woman who wants to be a man even though she and she's already identifying as such but she's still having a baby with another woman or whatever is the the combination that she it's good for her she will not be stopped she will we will not say anything but it's not a reason to completely change our approach or to make everybody else um yield to an uh, to a certain demand in terminology or in ways of feeling or talking no i think that that's just not right for the women that we are working with if that answers your question yeah. but it has yes, created problems because uh if internationally you want to get attention and you want to get support from the younger generation <clears throat> you should be willing to just say childbearing people chest feeding and i'm sorry it cannot i cannot stomach it if if you know this young woman i'm I hope can take it over from me. And when I'm long in my grave, and they say, oh, no, 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 no. We are just, this is all past. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> but, not, but not for me now, that would spoil the fun as it were. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I agree with you, uh, Leticia, Leticia, but um, it's the law, isn't it? This the law that is also binding us to certain, we're kind of restricted as well. If it's written in the law and it's taking away even our own human rights and freedom to to use the proper what I'd say proper pronouns to you know refer to a man and a wood, woman, so do you do you get those challenges as well? If because it's written in the law that you have to uh, abide. Uh, by? No, not in Africa, and also the way this is written in the law is by first. Uh, uh, making you know what shall i say corrupting the law because it's just absolutely impossible our system of 
our I mean I'm the daughter of somebody and even my mother who we were talking law day and night I mean there is no way you can set up a, a state in which the citizen is protected from from you know from the beginning till the end by by the state by the law if you are going to have a sort of loose and emotional uh, definition of who is what it just no we have to create um what shall i say an environment a society in which people in the private sphere can be the way they want to be but we cannot make this law for for every for every detail of our difference it's just not possible what we feel is not going to be you know written in law my feelings can change. I've already, you know, in the beginning when I started this, I got a lot of, you know, it just automatically came to me when I entered this field with um, Jumbo Mama and Safa and the app for uh, for pregnancy, etc. I received a lot of this information about uh, homosexual and well, all the other feelings. It's all about how you how you feel. Fine, but then. By the time it was achieved that people said, no, that is just how you are, so it must be accepted, then they began to protest and say, it's my choice. If I want to be different, I'm going to be different. So there is such a, it's so much more complex. And I feel that we have so much to do for people who, you know, apart from this, that this is like a, a separate issue that should not that should not take it, away our yes. attention and effort from what's uh, the suffering of the, of women and girls is not because they feel like that but because they are i mean if they it's not like they say oh i really want you oh i want to be with a man no the man who does this couldn't care less about how you feel so i find it it's not going to promote our our protection for anybody but that's my personal uh, so I yeah. don't know if it can be law and if I'm very, very skeptical about that. Mm -hmm. Because what we have seen also in the terminology, when we studied all the background materials, there was a, a way of pushing it, but pushing it through certain channels in the U, in the human rights system, that if you analyzed, were not really always legally correct. So... I don't know, but that's right. Yeah. And, and maybe one of the more, I felt one of the more important sort of evidences or discoveries was when we, you know, when we had these regional, we had regional meeting or briefing on this topic and we brought in women from one from Southeast Asia, I think from Africa, maybe Latin America. And, and just help, which helped us to just a little bit put more per perspective mm. on what is the, you know, what are really the, the, the key issues that we need to work on, simple, simple things like poverty and, you know, lack of education and all these things. And at least attributing a sort of the right amount of focus on, according to the, 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 the gravity of the issues, actually. And, and Anyway, I felt Letitia, you you are very eloquent actually in describing these things, and um, so. Yeah, it's. Um, I agree with you that these are, you know, they're such uh, terrible issues uh, uh, for women. Also, what I discover now that this is an an app for women. We I I have met so many good men in Africa. I said, oh, this is great because I lost my mother because of you know when she had to give birth to my uh, my little brother she didn't survive or a woman who was uh, who was a uh, yeah she became responsible for a religious community and she said oh i've raised my little brother because my mother died in childbirth this is so important so there is a lot of also among men a lot of sympathy for it but still once they are in so they have worked on this they've helped me but it's very hard to now gently take away from them this 
sort of advance on the women and say, but now women have to be also in the decision making. They're not just, you know, we are so good to you. This is what we give to you. No, they must be part of. And that's hard. That's hard to do. And that's not in legislation about the gender terminology, but it's just in what we try to fight for. For me, uh, women's the women's rights start with the right as it was expressed in the human rights in the declaration. That was after a certain moment, we were all, humanity was seen as to be progressing, improving. And well, there is, I mean, we are not living in, in holes under the ground anymore. And most of us do have electricity and we do have water, not all, but most of us. And therefore, the idea was that women and also children, but particularly women, should also share in the fruits of progress equally with men and equally not in the sense in as much or in exactly the same way, but in a way that would make them realize their potential. I mean, mm -hmm. you can never make us equal in that sense like like we are not equal we all look different here you know, if i look at the pictures we're all different so that's not the thing and we have different sizes and shapes so we have different needs even for clothes for food we have different tastes that's not how we have to equalize like like having some sort of roller coaster and for me that's the the biggest error that is being made now and i see it sometimes in education you hear parents talking with our children and they're all having an, an, an ice cream and then the father or the mother or the, the adults have a bigger ice cream or a different one and they just oh it's not it's not fair you have two and I only get one so <laughs> and, and there is this constant awareness of we all should get the same but mm. we shouldn't all get the same that's not going to make us happier or more equal or a fairer society no but how how show that difference I, I don't know but I find that important to to remember that you know one child you have a bigger family and some one of them really wants to to do what shall I say uh, horseback riding well horseback riding is expensive but somebody else like myself would prefer swimming Swimming doesn't cost anything. You just go to the lake and you swim. But does that mean that it's not fair? I should get in money a compensation for what my sibling got because he or she was allowed to go horseback riding. We cannot start a discussion. We will be in constant war with yeah. each other, with ourselves. It's just, an, it, it, it's not possible. Yeah. So. Yeah, we, actually we, as, as I think, yeah, please. Um... Marta, maybe. Also, introduce yourself. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marta de Carvalho. I am a lawyer, uh, and I'm working with law in Portugal. I am president of WFWP Portugal, and I am uh, from Mozambique, Africa, but living in Portugal. Uh, I want to say thank you to Leticia because it was really very deep uh, introduction of your life and your your story. It was so amazing to know uh, the way you have to cross. Okay, I have one question and one maybe one introduction of what we are speaking about. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can I can um, start with the question, and mm -hmm. my question is, um, I want I want to greet your work, uh, and the question is that uh, if you, you are thinking, for instance, to open way for the Portuguese speaking countries, because you spoke about the French language uh, countries. Mm -hmm and the uh, English countries, but I didn't see any 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 moment you speaking about these uh, speak, uh, Portuguese speaking countries. My, my question is, if you are thinking or if you, are, if you have any idea how to start this same job, as you know that it's not only for the French speaking countries or, uh, or English speaking countries, but also 
Portuguese speaking countries has the same problems in Africa and maybe in other ways and other countries. Uh, this is the question. And okay. the, the, um, uh, the, the introduction you, you, you said about the question Marcia made, I want to say that of course the law is something that accompanies the, the society. Uh, if we have situations, we have to take care with the law, uh, mm -hmm. as we all know. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we don't put limits to guide the society, we can get troubles. Mm -hmm. But the question that uh, Marcia put, I think that the problem is with education. Because of the law has to, to take care about the society with the situations that is already there, I think that we have to think how to educate the society for some good things, because we have to see the consequences uh, with these uh, permissions about law. Because if law permits some things and these things is not right, it's not good for anyone or for the people, even though they have these rights, they, they have to get because this is my life and I have this right, but they have to, to have someone with vision that has to see that the way we are taking our society nowadays, we, uh, our, our children after 100 years, maybe we are going to get many, many troubles in, yeah. the, in the world. So yeah. I think that for WFWP, our matter is education. Mm -hmm. And if we, we find partners like you, like someone else who works with many people and can take a seed, some, some seed to put there, not to, to say the people that, okay, you have not to do this or that, but maybe put something to let people think about, I think it's not bad at all. We are not crushing with law. We are only looking and having vision to see that if we don't put any limits, maybe we are going to get many troubles in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, Leticia, you. you want to respond to that then? Huh? Yes, I think that you mentioned something very important about the limits. What I see now is that we are, we are treating people who smoke as if they were criminals. People who like to have a drink, like this is very bad. People are looking at your weight. People are controlling in many things. But if it's in terms of if you want to give your children an education about sexual behavior and how it should be embedded into emotional and other, you know, a coherent whole, you are supposed to be, you know, interfering with your child's development or your limiting freedom. I find this ridiculous. There comes a point that you do not even want to be parents anymore because the state is telling you what you have to do with your child. And I think we have to be very careful because it's tough to be a parent, but it's because of that love and that relationship that you handle things that are diff difficult. But I find it out of proportion, just like we said, for the attention that we need for women and girls who still have such huge struggles and such huge obstacles to the fair access to the fruits of development of the world, of humanity. And in the same way, I find it unfair that you get uh, almost punished if you are a smoker, but you can be free in having the most outrageous sexual behavior. If we look at the costs of people who, you know, who just have total freedom in uh, medical care, in in all kinds of things around it, you say, hey, I mean, it's your choice, but it's not as if as parents, we are not allowed to say anything. We are. We, we are. Come on. And you're not going to tell me that this is not possible. We And of course, we will have... Uh, a more supple or a different approach to it than 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But we do not all have to become like forerunners uh, of, of, of the struggle for change. 
if everybody did that, there is no middle ground that keeps the peace and and you cannot be conservative if there is not somebody progressive and you cannot be in the safe middle ground and move in that if you if everybody is forced now to be progressive though they they aren't i mean in certain things i find this also uh, a huge international and national issue that we are undermining the middle class in it's almost like a, a four letter word now Whereas the middle class is the people who have, you know, who are capable of compromising, of sometimes listening to some more extreme, but also to more conservative. And that's what keeps us going as a society. And if we... so, yes, I agree with you that we have to be allowed and should fight, I would say, for the right that we set limits if we think there should be limits. Yeah. And we all know, I remember a, f a friend of ours, he had a daughter, that daughter was just uncontrollable. She was so full of hormones, let me say, she would go out and she would go. And yes, they gave that girl, they told her that it was not good. And they gave her the pill and said, okay, I mean, you're not, you shouldn't be doing this, but here you are. But that doesn't mean that every girl, the the most timid and the most, you know, slow developing should be pushed as if that's the way to go. There are children who need that. And there's others who do not need that, who would like to grow up in a gentler or in a different way. And that's a right that we have, too. I mean, in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. We uh, have two ways. Anyone else? Maybe someone else can introduce yourself to Letitia and with Thank you very much. some comment or some. Who is that? Uh, Amanda or I can't see who that is. Huh? Out outside. Amanda. Amanda. So Amanda, please. I'm from Ireland. I just want to say how inspiring it is to listen to Letitia. Not only you were so young with your husband and then being pregnant and. I think the experience and the challenges that you overcome, you really gain that wisdom and that experience that you don't just naturally have. So even when you were mentioning in Africa, how the, the girl that has the talent, you know, to move forward, but you have the, the man who's in control of the programming. So it's a little bit out of place for her to take his place, but you're kind of guiding him and encouraging him and, taking care of him and I just thought that's so graceful because you know even though you can see she has the skills but that's where I find the challenge is to negotiate yeah. how do we yeah. maintain a good relationship and inspire that change that people don't feel you know challenged or inadequate and that the other thing I was thinking is here in the west I mean we have access we can go to the hospital that isn't a challenge for us as such but actually finding the courage to to speak correctly and to speak in a proper way is a little bit more challenging. And I think many times people are kind of scared because there's, yeah. as yeah. Mitty was mentioning about, you know, legal terminology and the law. So you want to be correct and you want to do things in a correct way, but it's finding the voice. And that's what I thought you were very inspiring about because that's how I think you could inherit how to negotiate those places. And for young people, I'd love to see, you know, younger women being able to work or shadow people in that area. And for that, I'm very grateful. Do you have wow, any wow. things or? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I really I, like I it. Really so like I just Mm. The, 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 what I do the, now I do to now make sure, sure that this young woman gets her space when she mentions a problem for me I uh, I make a draft letter and I send it to her and say would you like me to say it this way or do you think because I say it's your it's your country it's your relationship with him that has to develop in the long run and I can, you know, I can for, misjudge from a distance. So I tell her, this is what I want to, to write. Uh, and sometimes, yeah, it's fine. But, and then she says, you could take this off or you could say this differently. And then I let it sit a little. I do it another time. 
And then I write something again and she says, oh, thank you. This way we can move forward without getting stuck because you may want to solve something and you may, you know, uh, make the conflict even worse because they feel even more offended <laughs> than before. <laughs> so that really works fine because it also means that she is thinking, I'm thinking with her, she's thinking with me. How am I going to... Uh, to conquer that space and show that we can work together and that I'm not there to kick him out or something because that's not what we want to do. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see the time is just about one hour is up. Um, uh, Mitty, I think you tried to take a, a, a screenshot, right? Oh, I did. But I was going to say, maybe there are so many people that have their cameras off. Would would anyone want to turn their camera on to be a part of a screenshot before? Uh, um, you just get it on. So. Yeah, there we go. If everyone, yeah. <laughs> Good. As I say, right. Yeah, I wanted to say something about the law. You know, especially running up to, to Easter, of course, we've read quite a few things. If those of you who follow a little bit the Bible... And you, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, how do you say it in English? That's the word that I don't know. Pharisees. Pharisees, which were the law, the ones who were always obsessed with the law. And, uh, but my father taught us the law is not going to make our society never, ever. It can rein us in. But if we do not have a moral foundation of an, an agreement in our culture, you know, then, I mean, then it's like a football match. You can you can have an arbiter and he can he can blow the whistle, but that's not how we can make a society. And that's what sometimes I feel we are forgetting. We are I mean, law is developing as if we were a, a, an arbiter in a in a soccer match, and that's not what it is. It can only rein us in or indicate where our common sense and understanding stops. So if we do not cultivate that common sense and understanding. We are going to be at war all the time and we are going to go into one court case after another and they will be totally unsolvable. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's, so that's, that's the fear, isn't it? How to, how to counteract the law because of the punishment that comes to good people speaking up, you know, and there's the fear factor, as Amanda mentioned, you know, it's a, it's a really a dilemma for us now. Mm. Yeah, I'm not afraid anymore, but then I'm a little bit older and my children are going their own way. I say, if I have to go into prison for it, so be it. I mean, <laughs> it's so it's so silly. I mean, no. <laughs> we'll bail you out, actually. We'll go, go fund me and bail you out. <laughs> yeah. Or you just come and see me and then we have a real free chat there and have a lot of fun. <laughs> It's just amazing. I'm sorry I to butt in, but I, I really want to say it was really an inspiration to hear you speak, Mrs. Letizia, honestly. Um, oh, my gosh. We yeah. need to have more give and take and more <laughs> women like you. And yeah. yeah, it's incredible. Thank you for being so open and so uh, honest and from the heart and incredible. Yeah, I thought yeah. that's such a good point. You know, the laws, they have to help rein us in. But uh, like your father said, that's so good that the conscience has to be the one yes. that really we keep in the front of our activities and life. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. That's really important. What I really wish you could say, um, that is what really uh, drives me most. The women or the people that I meet in Africa, when I first started with this, I met a woman from the Maasai. And at one point, I got a little message, SMS, and she said, Leticia, I pray that you continue. Do not let anything stop you. This is what we need. I got messages like that. So there is such a demand. Mm. And also last time, this woman almost cried. It was a community health worker. I was sitting next to her or a midwife, and I was showing her the app. And I am so busy with all this micromanagement that I cannot even look at my own app anymore. And I discover what's in there. And she said, oh, did you make us offers? This is what I need. And I thought, oh, this is just such a moment. It was oh, fantastic because I had forgotten myself. You get obsessed with, you know, like an advocate with what you're doing and you forget the thing itself. But she said, yeah, 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 that's so good. Mm. Uh, so, uh, that was uh, 
Yeah, thank you. I, I was just also reminded how important it is to have these kind of safe, even even your app is sort of a safe space mm. that can, that for these women that they can trust and they, because instead of living in a kind of fear of or uncertainty, what if that app yeah. gives them some kind of security? And then I thought even, even, even what we're doing here, you know, this kind of space of being able mm. to listen to you and to sort of express our own our own situation. We also, in the Women's Federation, we have quite a few um, schools in Africa. Oh. And one big element of our of all of our schools is character education programs. Oh, really, really strengthen those, you know, what they are getting at home, surely, but strengthening this this con this idea of, of conscience and uh, you know exactly mm -hmm. what you described about that the child doesn't have to look to the parent and compare that the parent has more than they do. I mean, this is really like upside down thinking and most yes. children do not normally think like that actually. So, mm -hmm. but um, but even I thought, even in our in this terminology task force that we had, even the same time, the same idea that we, we had several meetings where we could just talk frankly about those things mm -hmm. with women who are, who struggle when they hear, when they hear some of the, the way things are developing in the world and they just can't, wrap their head around it and they have no one to talk to actually and yeah. to, to be able to not to force anyone to think any particular way but to create a safe space where we can just express our concerns and sort of come to oftentimes come to some kind of consensus together based on common sense and you know our own good conscience and mind so anyway i appreciate so much letitia she is really a great woman and uh, thank you so much for taking time with us. Are you now in Switzerland or France or in Yeah, I'm Africa? in France. I just had to ask Eva. I had to say something to Eva. Eva, I'd love to do it in Portuguese, but if people, we have it in Kikongo, in Kiswahili, in English and in French. And I handle the four languages, Kikongo with some help, Swahili with some help, but I really cannot do Portuguese. And also it is costing a lot of money. I mean, if we had somebody who wants to translate completely and, you know, and you find someone who can, you know, a, a, a programmer, developer or something, go ahead. You're mm -hmm. most welcome. Shall but I we give have her... place, space for 10 languages. Uh, I'll give her your email address, Letitia. Yeah. And you can get Good. in contact with each other. Huh? Good. Thank you very much. Okay, so any last Sorry, last just word? Uh, one yeah, practical sure. question. Were you yeah. going to share the link of your app or something? <laughs> yes. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. So what we are doing right now is putting it on Google uh, Play. And for Google Play, I'm turning round and round with my identity verification. All the time they say, it's not good enough. You have to redo it. So that's why we haven't put it on Google Play, but we just have a link APK that I send you and then you can use it. And the reason why I do not feel so uh, sad about having the APK link only is there is, you know, the matter of uh, electronic patient data that mm. need protection. So uh, it's better that we have formal agreement of the medical uh, institutions using it than that they already find it on Google Play and they say, hey, but uh, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. So we would give you access to the testing where there is no real uh, patient data where you can just create, you play with the Tanzanian, you know, wards, districts, hospitals, etc., and with fake identities. Right. So you have you can make yourself a young woman of only 15 and you can make yourself a, a woman who has not had a baby for nine years. You can take these special cases that require special attention and you can see what if you put in a certain blood pressure, what is the reply coming from the app? And maybe you will even have advice how we can do better because we can only make it a shared thing and really make use of the of the knowledge that everybody has if people use it and say, oh, but I think that in our group, 90, you know, a blood pressure of, of 120 over 90 is OK. Whereas in the WHO, it says if you are over 85, it's already watch it. 
So there are maybe detailed things that you will come up with that we can discuss. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe just, I know we have at least one medical doctor on the screen. Maybe yes. uh, Maria, you want to say thank you to Letitia and if you want to make some comment at the same time, and then I think we will close. Huh? You, you are muted. Yes, now I am not. Yeah, thank you very much, Letizia. I was medical doctor uh, in Austria. Yes. And I had many international women. And I could enjoy to talk with them. And I was not going to the foreign countries. I was always in Austria. Yeah. But it was very nice to listen to your explanation and to your support for the women. Oh, yes. Your... Thank you. Well, it, you were wonderful as well as listeners and that you appreciate. That's nice. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Maria is also the, the head of the UN team, our UN team in Vienna, in fact, yeah. with the CCPCJ and other entities. Huh? So everyone, thank you so much for joining. Mitty, you want to say a closing word then? Wow. Yes, of course. I would love to say something. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, informative, but also so artistic and sacrificial your journey, you know, to to make a difference in the lives of people who don't have those opportunities. And you've used the the talents that, you know, you, you've been gifted with and you use them for the purpose of helping others. And it's a, it's a very noble cause that you're doing. And Actually, we want to help you uh, continue, and there's no way we want to to visit you in prison. We will be <laughs> we'll be yeah. on this journey with you, and you can guarantee, you know, WFWP will support you. And uh, we want to invite you to come to more of our events and to share. I think you've only touched the tip of the iceberg with all your yeah. wealth of experience. Uh, so thank you yes. so much. Before, you know, because of this thing, I also looked at the publication that I did. Well, the list and list and list of them. And I thought, oh, I don't do anything with them anymore. But it's a bit of a pity. There was one, which is the Latter-day Saints among you will in will be interested. I did it for them. The family in the new millennium. Ooh. And the family in the new millennium. Uh, my point was that everybody begins to talk about children that get trafficked. And then they say it's because of poverty. But I tell you, when I was a director of Defense for Children, it was not because of poverty. It was because women or people in the villages wanted to have a television set or this and that. Not a single person, not a single person is, is too much said. But it's very rare that people have to go to these extremes of selling their children for, you know, for purposes of making them survive. Uh, mostly it is like some blurred ID. It's not too bad for them. And we have this and that and the other. So I found, I found that they always started the retrieval, the retrieval too late. I said, look in the village first, what's happening there? Is there still a connection between the parental generation and the children? And if we pursue, as uh, Eva correctly said, what we are doing now, we are making a total break between the parental generation who will say, right, it's not my responsibility anymore. I, I'm not allowed to do this. I'm not allowed to do that. My child is shooing me. Forget it. If that break is complete, we hell is loose for all of us. I tell you, for the children, but for us and for everyone, it's just not going to be livable. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's what I think. Yeah, I, think so. yeah I, I agree. Yeah, I think we all do here. So yeah. thank you, everyone. And uh, I, I also had wanted to hear more about this time when you were ahead of Defense for Children, but I think today we don't have time. So maybe we have to invite you up for a sequel, a sequel uh, yeah. Yeah. in a few months. <laughs> yes, when you when you invite me for that, uh, for the when I was Defense for Children's director, our main focus was children in adult prisons, oh. because as we speak, and I think it may have changed a little bit, there can be three million children in the world in prison who are under age, under 18, and only three or five percent of them are there for a real reason, because they committed something that is considered a delinquent, a delinquency, a, a criminal act. Most of them because they were, you know, at the wrong place at the wrong time, which is a very, very bad thing. I can tell you, I, I've been obsessed with it when I was responsible for the at defense for children. It was really a big, big issue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.